You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 29, sonnet 28. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never, never surrender? After my knee surgery at the beginning of May, I made a few attempts to continue with the podcast. Sadly, the post-anesthetic fog only eventually wore off after about two months, and while I had been fully aware that my brain wasn't firing on all cylinders, I only realize now just how bad my situation was when I read the following notes that I wrote down back then. Although Sonnet 28 is full of interesting wordplay, it is particularly opaque and the variety of linguistic insights that we can tease out don't seem to form anything coherent outside of the straightforward reading. Well, let me begin this episode by saying that I was a bit wrong in that assessment. It's been just over six months since my last podcast episode. Six months filled with recovery, difficulties at work, my wife undergoing two serious back surgeries three months apart, and dealing with our four-year-old son reacting to having two pretty useless parents at the same time. Things have stabilized over the last few weeks, though, so hopefully I'll be returning to some kind of regular cadence. During this time, we've made some progress on the graphic novel, republishing the originally offensive page 3 and putting out a page 4 that gets the idea across without showing anything explicit. Although the tattoo project is not directly connected to the crowdfunding campaign, the four new tattoos that I've managed to acquire have generated a fair amount of interest and I'm praying that that will turn into more dollars for the comics. At the end of October, I finally finished compiling Volume 1 of the book version of Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, and I am very excited by how it's turned out. I'm giving my proofreaders another few days before I make it publicly available in spite of them. It makes all of this information a lot easier to digest, and I suspect that many people will be more comfortable shelling out a couple of dollars for a book as opposed to an investment in a future graphic novel. As I've stated before, the book and its future volumes and editions will remain perpetually free for all of my patrons. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, ten times that dollar will bring you the finished product ten times faster. To my patrons, I cannot thank you enough for your contributions and your patience, and for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. You play a crucial role in making this work, so thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Sonnet 28 Sonnet 28 follows directly from Sonnet 27, in which Shakespeare's legacy-obsessed knights contend with his daily efforts and obligations. One note before I begin, the original quarto text ends with a peculiar use of parentheses to indicate formatting that has inspired me to question whether there might be some kind of relationship between all of the parenthesized words scattered across the sonnet sequence. I'm just putting that out there to suggest that further investigation may be warranted. How can I then return in happy plight that am debarred the benefit of rest? When day's oppression is not eased by night, but day by night and night by day oppressed, and each, though enemies to either's reign, do in consent shake hands to torture me, the one by toil, the other to complain, how far I toil, still further off from thee. I tell the day to please him thou art bright, and dost him grace when clouds do blot the heaven. So flatter I the swart complexioned night, when sparkling stars twire not, thou guilest the heaven. But day doth daily draw my sorrows longer, and night doth nightly make grief's length seem stronger. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 28. How can I then return in happy plight, that am debarred the benefit of rest, when day's oppression is not eased by night, but day by night and night by day oppressed? In addition to go back to, 
return can be read as to give in repayment. The straightforward reading of happy plight is clear in modern English, but in those days happy also meant lucky, favored by fortune, being in advantageous circumstances or prosperous, and plight meant condition or a pledge that involved risk. Debarred in English meant excluded, prevented or prohibited, but in Old French meant to unlock or unbolt. This potentially presents the word as an antithesis to itself, but the reason I find it interesting is because it takes us back to Sonnet 25's Fortune of Such Triumph Bars, and if I that am debarred is intended to mean I that am not imprisoned, then this could suggest that the speaker is the author and not the sonnet, while at the same time it may be suggesting that it is Shakespeare himself who is confined to his physical body, and that his sonnets are Shakespeare's released reflections that are free to sail forth into eternity. A brief web search into the origins of Shakespeare's nickname, The Bard, were not particularly fruitful, but it seems reasonable to assume that even if Shakespeare wasn't referred to as The Bard of Avon in his own time, he might have referenced himself in this way as the author of the sonnets. With that in mind, Shakespeare appears to make good use of his French throughout the sonnets, and the word debarred might be read both as without the bard or as of the bard. Benefit meant a beneficial thing, advantage or profit, but also a good or noble deed, a helpful or friendly action. Oppression meant cruel or unjust use of power or authority. But Old French included a pressing down, and this may be a reference to the printing press and the act of publication. Eased meant to help or assist, but the odd original spelling E-A-Z-D stands out as intentional. The first quatrain seems to me to be contrasting not only the days and nights of Shakespeare's life, but the days of his life and the nights of his afterlife as the sonnets as well as the days and nights of the sonnet sequence, which would be the openings and closings of the book. What I find the most powerful interpretation, however, is that Shakespeare's knight might refer to his life after his son was taken from him. Return can mean Shakespeare returning to his regular work, or to his happy state prior to his son dying, but it could also refer to his return to the world through his sonnets after his own death, which would be a direct conflation of the poet and his poetry. During the writing of the sonnets, Shakespeare would have been losing sleep due to his grief over his son's death and his obsession with the sonnets, which would lead him to be unable to return to his daily life in a happy or productive state. His restless nights would be costing him his days, probably literally in that the sonnet's long dark night cost him so much of his life's effort, being the investment and waste that the sonnets have referred to before on multiple occasions. At the same time, whatever effort he expended in his day-to-day -day endeavors would be at the cost of his sonnets, which I find ironic, seeing as it's not Shakespeare's sonnets that have ensured his legacy, but rather his plays. If Sonnet 28 days are Shakespeare's life, and the nights the sonnet readings once he has died, then Shakespeare will not be able to return to his happy plight, and the sonnets, who are of the bard, will have been debarred or abandoned by their author. Shakespeare's spirit, on its journey into the future, would be unable to benefit from the rest that Shakespeare himself could have expected to find in the grave, because it would be constantly worrying about and working towards being read. If the nights, as in the previous sonnet, are the times when the book is closed and the sonnets are not being read, then whatever day's oppression may be, the nights will certainly not be easing the sonnet's anxieties. If the nights are Shakespeare's life after Hamlet's death, then his grief would be tarnishing his memories of his happier life before the tragedy struck, and his happy memories would be rendering his grief all the deeper. And each, though enemies to ether's reign, do in consent shake hands to torture me, the one by toil, the other to complain, how far I toil, still further off from thee. Enemy was enemy, adversary, foe, or demon, and references the established military theme. In modernized versions of the sonnets, ether has been replaced by either, 
which is a valid reading, but it ignores the original text's additional connotation. Ether meant upper regions of space, from Old French the upper pure, bright air, sky, or firmament. I've mentioned the alchemy theme before, and in that context it's quite likely that it intends to suggest quintessence, the fifth element. Rain meant to hold or exercise sovereign power, and here is possibly used as kingdom. Consent remains consistent with modern usage as agree, give assent, or yield when one has the right, power, or will to oppose. We're familiar with the word torture as to inflict great pain or agony, but its original, less used, more literal meaning of to contort, twist, or distort would have been well understood in Middle English. Complain meant lament, bewail, grieve which is what the sonnets do for their creator throughout the sequence, and to find fault, express dissatisfaction, or criticize. But it also carried make a formal accusation or charge to an authority, which ties in with the established legal theme. In the second quatrain, each refers to day and night, or their personifications, but also Shakespeare and his sonnets, his obsession with writing his sonnets, and his fear of dying without legacy. These are enemies of Ether's reign, the universal laws, in that they are prolonging Shakespeare's reach even after he has died without a son. All of these opposing entities and thoughts come together to cause distress and to distort Shakespeare and his sonnet representatives. Shakespeare toils, his sonnets complain, and the more effort Shakespeare invests, the further away his sonnets will travel from his physical body. The more disconnected Shakespeare and his sonnets become, the sadder they both will be, but at the same time, that distance between them will serve as Shakespeare's measurement of success. The sonnets put in their hard work by being read, but when they are not read, they can only grieve. I tell the day to please him thou art bright, and dost him grace when clouds do blot the heaven. So flatter I the swart complexioned night. When sparkling stars twire not, thou guilest the heaven. Day here is capitalized, distinguishing it from all previous uses. Art here functions as R and produce art, as it does elsewhere in the sonnets. Grace has appeared before, both as favor and esteem, divine unmerited favor, love or help, and as pardon or excuse. Cloud, in addition to its current meaning, was also used to suggest anything that obscures, darkens, threatens, or casts a shadow. Blot meant to make blots, as in with ink, or disfigure with blots, but was also used figuratively in the mid-15th century as to blot out or obliterate. So, in this context, can be read both as therefore and in this way. Swart meant black or dark, possibly a reference to the color of the ink that the sonnets were written in. Complexion recalls the gold complexion from sonnet 18. Flatter meant seek to please or gratify someone by undue praise. Praise insincerely or beguile with pleasing words. And in Shakespeare's time also suggested show something to its best advantage. In both modern and old French, the word also means caress or pet. Twire meant to peep out, pry about, twinkle, glance, or gleam. I keep repeating that I don't believe that there are typos in the 1609 quarto edition of Shakespeare's sonnet, and here we have a great example of why in guilest, which in modernized versions of the text has been translated to gildest. To me, that seems like a bit of a stretch. Guilest means deceive or trick, but in the late 16th century included entertain, and all three meanings fit well with the flattery of the previous line. Now that we've got the definitions out of the way. I tell the day to please him thou art bright, lacks punctuation, so can be read as in order to please him I tell the day that you are bright, or in order to please him I tell the day that he is bright, as well as, I tell the day that I have made you bright in order to please him. The latter two readings fit better with the following line than the former, 
and suggest a number of possibilities. One, Shakespeare is telling the sonnets that the reader graces them or thinks or reports of them fondly even when the book is closed. Two, the sonnets are telling Shakespeare that the reader graces him even after his death. Three, the sonnets tell the reader that Shakespeare is bright, which is strongly related to the sense in which the word bright appears in the rest of the sequence. Four, Shakespeare is telling the reader that the sonnets are bright and grace the reader on their literal or emotional dark days. Just as the day is being flattered in these lines, so must the night be flattered. Alternatively, the night is being flattered in order to ensure that the day is graced even when he or his son is blotted out. When the stars are not twinkling or the nights are dark, Shakespeare and the sonnets entertain the reader and trick them into experiencing the brilliance of the bard and his work as opposed to the bleak reality around them. This can also be read as, when Shakespeare is dead, his sonnets will continue to shine in his place. With the original text lacking an H, the final word of line 12 could be read as both even or evening, but also as heaven, a heavenly place, a state of bliss, sky or covering. While I agree that it's unlikely that Shakespeare would have rhymed heaven with heaven, with the TH preceding it, it does seem like the reader is intended to see the word. And when one recites the sonnet, as one should, it does sound kind of like the heaven. Or perhaps it's supposed to be read thieven, which may be a stretch, but thieving works suspiciously well with guilist, and it fits with the sonnet sequence's central theme of stealing more lifetime than one is allotted, as well as making use of the reader's body and mind to do so. But day doth daily draw my sorrows longer, and night doth nightly make grief's length seem stronger. Draw has been encountered in earlier sonnets and suggests the act of writing as much as it does drawing out. Sorrow meant grief, regret, trouble, care, pain, and anxiety, contrasting with grief, which meant hardship, suffering, pain, bodily affliction, or wrong, grievance, injustice, misfortune, and calamity. If the closing couplet is describing Shakespeare's state of mind, then his days and his anxieties are made longer by his restless nights and his nightly obsessions, whereas his grief, the deep sense of suffering, injustice, and calamity of his son and his legacy being taken from him would only become stronger. If the closing couplet describes Shakespeare's sonnets, Shakespeare is literally drawing or writing his sonnets longer by extending them into the complete sequence, and each night that these sonnets exist, are worked on or are read, makes them more powerful. The most interesting reading may be a combination of the two. Shakespeare, the day of the sonnet sequence, becomes ever sadder as he continues to grieve for himself and his son through his work on the sonnets, while the sonnets, the length or accounting of his grief, appear to become more powerful as time goes by. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com, Facebook, Minds.com, Twitter, Instagram, or read it. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender.